In the following dramatization, note how a Bible student's faith is tested as he thinks about whether he could start sharing in the ministry and become one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I love my Bible study. It's changed my life, and I really want to start in the ministry. In my town, everybody knows you and what you do. I'm not ashamed of the good news, but what if I become a witness? The family business has two employees, Dad and me. Hey, Dad. Hey, Nelson. Did they leave yet? Yeah, they, uh, they actually just left. Look, son. Going to meetings is one thing, but if you're out there preaching, we'll both be out of work. Nelson. Nelson. Can you see how Nelson's faith was being tested? He had to decide whether to be more concerned with what other humans thought of him or doing all that he could to secure Jehovah's approval. Is your faith being tested like Nelson's? Nobody's faith is being tested like Nelson's. I mean, what were we just watching? Apparently, this is what's going through the minds of people who study with Jehovah's Witnesses. I love my Bible study. It's changed my life, and I really want to start in the ministry. Said no one studying with Jehovah's Witnesses ever. Even if you happen to be finding your Bible study rewarding, I'm sorry, this is just not a realistic thing that you would be thinking as someone studying the Bible with Jehovah's Witnesses. And I say this as someone who has been a Jehovah's Witness for many years, and either conducted many Bible studies or attended many Bible studies, you never encounter people who say, oh, this Bible study has changed my life. <laughs> or when do I get to go out preaching? I just cannot wait to go bothering people on their doorsteps and telling them to change their religion to mine. So like most dramatizations, I'm afraid this is completely unrealistic. And it seems to be setting this narrative that, again, the world is out to get Jehovah's Witnesses. Everyone hates Jehovah's Witnesses. That was clearly the message when Nelson was <laughs> looking out from his doorstep and seeing the disapproving looks of his neighbours. And even on the phone to his dad, who he's apparently in business with, his dad's telling him, oh, we'll lose our business if you become one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Don't be silly. It's just not the world we live in. You do not lose your business in the 21st century just because you've decided to join some fringe religious movement. And in the rare case where that might happen, what do we then say about those who've lost their jobs because they've left Jehovah's Witnesses? Because maybe their boss or their manager happens to be a Jehovah's Witness and they don't want to be sharing the same workplace as someone who no longer shares their views and might try to share apostate views with them. So yes, I'm afraid this dramatization is laughably unrealistic. It's part of a talk by Robert Saranko, who we just saw. He's giving the symposium item, imitate the faithful, not the faithless, Jesus disciples, not the Pharisees, and Robert Siranko, who is a helper to the writing committee, has more wisdom to share. Jesus' disciples did not allow the religious leaders' pressure and threats to deter them. They knew their priorities and that situations would arise when a Christian cannot obey both men and Jehovah God. You see, human rulers forfeit their right to our obedience when they demand what Almighty God prohibits or, as in this case, when they prohibit what God requires of us. Even if they ban our preaching work, we cannot stop carrying out our God-given assignment to preach the good news. So, at that very moment, the apostles set a precedent for all true Christians throughout the ages. 
to obey God as ruler first. I thought this was a really interesting soundbite for those interested in learning more about Jehovah's Witnesses and their problems with child safeguarding. This explains, in a nutshell, I believe, why there are so many problems and why Jehovah's Witness policies are so far adrift of what's expected in this day and age of institutions when it comes to protecting children. The majority of institutions will fall over themselves to not just observe the law, but be one or two steps ahead of the law because they realize their responsibility to protect children. But as far as Jehovah's Witnesses are concerned, they have a command from God in the form of the two witness rule that's telling them if two people didn't witness this act of child abuse, it effectively didn't happen. Now, they can argue all they like that this is an ecclesiastical position and it has no bearing on whether crime gets reported to the authorities, but the stats don't lie. When the Australian Royal Commission investigated Jehovah's Witnesses, they got the records, they found there had been 1,006 cases of abuse stretching between 1950 and 2014 and not a single one had been reported to the authorities. The reason, because Jehovah's Witnesses don't think it happened if it wasn't witnessed by two people. If the elders don't think it happened from a judicial point of view, you can understand why the organisation would be averse to reporting it to the authorities and getting involved in a police investigation that could end up bringing the organization into disrepute. In other words, they put the welfare of the organization ahead of the welfare of the child. And it's this thinking expressed by Robert Siranko that drives this whole philosophy. You see, human rulers forfeit their right to our obedience when they demand what Almighty God prohibits. Or, as in this case, when they prohibit what God requires of us. In other words, it doesn't really matter what human rulers expect of an institution like Jehovah's Witnesses when it comes to child safeguarding practices. If Jehovah's Witnesses think they know better, if Jehovah's Witnesses believe they have a divine mandate to do it a certain way, then that's the way they're going to do it. And they're going to stick to that way in their minds as a matter of loyalty to God. Let's watch the rest of the dramatization that we saw earlier. Nelson had just heard his dad tell him over the phone, going to meetings is one thing, but if you're out there preaching, we'll both be out of work. Let's see if Nelson will imitate the faith of Jesus' disciples. Is dad right? We'd be ruined if I became a witness? But what would happen if I don't? Rob and Nick live in the same town with the same pressures. But they preach and support their families. Their joy is real. Do I really want fear of man to stop me from becoming Jesus' disciple? John 3 verse 36 says, The one who exercises faith in the Son has everlasting life. It's time to exercise my faith and let Jehovah do the rest. Remember the question that Nelson asked himself? Do I really want fear of man to stop me from becoming Jesus' disciple? Well, Robert, there was actually a different question that Nelson asked himself that he didn't actually answer that I was more interested in. Is Dad right? 
we'd be ruined if I became a witness. But what would happen if I don't? What would happen if I don't become a witness? He never actually answers that question. And it's just as well, because if he were to answer that question, if he were to, I don't know, picture the fireballs coming down and the ground opening up or the building collapsing and him dying a grisly death at Armageddon, <laughs> that would be yet another video that Jehovah's Witness parents would need to write in and complain about. But wouldn't that have at least been an honest answer to his question? Again, in the dramatization, he asks the question and then just immediately goes to a different train of thought about how great it is that Rob and Nick live in the same town and they're able to carry on preaching and still support their families. Let's be clear, no one is asking whether it's financially viable to become one of Jehovah's Witnesses. That is not the issue here. People are not thinking, yes, but I'll lose my job or I'll lose my business if I become one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Again, it's not impossible that that could happen. I don't know, it's conceivable at least. But realistically, in the 21st century, that is not going to be an issue unless you happen to live in, I don't know, a Muslim country where there are virtually no Jehovah's Witnesses to preach to you anyway. The main issue that should be off-putting to someone who's considering joining Jehovah's Witnesses is that it's a cult, <laughs> is that when you become a Jehovah's Witness, you have your life micromanaged for you by an organization whose leaders meet every Wednesday at their lakeside compound in upstate New York. Leaders who care only about their power and authority and the prosperity of their organization. The leaders who don't really care about you and what your interests are to the extent where your life is of secondary value to the religion. You will need to lay down your life if, for example, a blood transfusion is the only option. And that's before we even get into shunning and the failed predictions and the cover-up of abuse. There are any number of reasons why no one should be joining Jehovah's Witnesses. Losing your job or losing your business is simply not one of them. 